we all know about refactoring that code. I mean, this is the common thing. The code smells. We improve our design without changing function. You know, we improve code quality. We actually refactor without any function, so we clean up our code without fear of breaking the system, because if we have tests, the tests will still run. Well, I love Martin Fowler's book on refactoring. I highly recommend it. Uh, it's kind of two books in one. The first book is The Philosophy of Refactoring. It's about 100 pages. Everybody should read that. The rest of the book is a catalog of the refactorings and the methods that are there. And I remember when it first came out and I read it, I liked it, but I thought it was half the book that it should have been. That it also should talk about, well, you know, what if you have good design? It's really good code. It's great design. But now a new requirement comes in, and now your design's insufficient. And it seemed to me that uh, the book should talk about this, and it didn't. And I wondered, well, maybe Martin uh, doesn't agree with this. And I always like to talk to you know people who've got a lot of experience and smarts. And Martin was at a conference uh, that I was at as well, and but he's busy, so how's he going to take time to talk to me? So I kidnapped him for 30 minutes. And uh, actually, what I did is I offered him a ride to the airport, but that's just as good because if you're giving a ride to an airport and you want to talk to them, they have to talk to you. I mean, what are, you, what are they going to do? You just slow down. You know? Oh, you know. So anyway, he and I talked for a few minutes about this, and I asked him, I said, Martin, I love your book, but it seemed to me you left out what happens when the code's tight, but a new requirement means the code needs to be changed. And the, the design now needs to accommodate this, even though I had great code, and that I could use the, the refactoring notion to, again, change the system, change the design with no problem. And that the exact same refactorings he had in his book could be used not to improve the quality of the code, but could be used to improve the quality of the design. And although this was a dozen years ago, I can still remember exactly what he said. He said, I agree with you. My book was long enough as it was. And I just laughed. I said, OK. As a, as a fellow author, I understand. So the insight is this. When your design is insufficient, you refactor it before adding new functionality just like when your code is bad. So what we're going to do here is now refactoring good code with a new requirement or refactoring a new architecture means we change it without adding any functionality and we do it in two steps. And there are reasons for this. We want to first take a background and get a principle here called the open and close principle. You know, software entities, classes, modules, functions, etc., should be open for extension and closed for modification. There's a reference to a good article by Bob Martin on this. This was actually put forward by Bertrand Meyer, the creator of uh, Eiffel and Design by Contract. Uh, but basically, it means that you can design so when you have to add something, you don't have to change the code. You just extend it. Here's a simple example of it. Let's say I've got a client using some abstraction. That could be an abstract class. It could be, uh, it could be an interface. And if I now need to add a new implementation, I just add it. You know, it does, line doesn't change, abstraction A, all the implementations don't change, my factory might change. But it's kind of kind of minimal in the whole thing. So this is a very powerful mechanism. And we want to understand this when I talk about the evolutionary nature of things. Because what we're saying is we want to look at why refactoring designs works in the same way refactoring code works is because while we're adding new code, while updating design, we're doing two things, and we therefore have risk. And if something goes wrong, we don't know which actually uh, broke or which guy, uh, you know, where the cause was. I'm sure you've all had this experience of, you know, making a couple of changes, and then something broke, and you, oh, I did it because it was so easy. But then all of a sudden, when something goes wrong, doing the two changes, you're not quite sure where it is. It messes your mind, and you can't ever really figure out what's going on. So Refactoring designs in the same way refactoring code works, because changing a design is risky because it could it, it could it could it, it could upset things, but your tests are in place. So if you're changing design with no functionality, your tests should still run. So in the higher situation of changing the design, you actually have tests and you're in good shape. Now adding code when you have good design is not risky. <laughs> not if you're using the open close. Uh, you know, if we go back to this example here. Adding the simple for is actually a low risk situation because none of the code is changing. Only I'm adding the implementation for, and I'm adding a factory which says maybe how do I, or I'm updating the factory which says how do I do it. So I'm really in a very low risk situation. So this two step process is a very good way of minimizing risk to change. And that's actually what we want to do, of course. So if we're saying we don't have our 
design up front perfect and we're going to have to change it, then what we have to do is minimize the risk of change. And refactoring code and refactoring designs is the next level. It's actually a very important concept, a very important tool to use. Thanks for watching this lightning webinar brought to you by NetObjectives. We're committed to equipping our clients with effective business-driven software development methods so they can be more successful. Please let us know how we could help you. Visit us at www.netobjectives.com.